Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 5th edition Vampire the Masquerade tabletop role-playing rules by World of Darkness. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. Listeners should know that this podcast is intended for a mature audience and will include strong language and mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and so forth, that may bear resemblance to entities living, dead, or undead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Rena Henze, and for tonight's game, I will be your storyteller. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Old Ways podcast, Vampire the Masquerade Chronicle. We are still in our interlude phase in between seasons. So tonight we are bringing you yet another focus on one of our Coterie members. And uh, before we go any further, they should probably introduce themselves. So to my right. Hi, this is Mike, and I am playing Marcus Voss of Clan Bruja. Indeed you are. And Marcus is our only Coterie member for tonight. So let's get down to business and see what Marcus has been up to in the past month or so, other than having some fun with his new blood bond partner, as we've (laughs) seen in a previous episode. So it is about December 9th or 10th. Getting pretty chilly. The wind is starting to get a bit wet the way it does December, January, coming off the Pacific, that kind of cold, harsh, biting wind that goes through whatever clothes you're wearing doesn't really particularly bother you anymore, but you remember the feeling of it from when you were still mortal. And it's easier to move around the streets. More people are staying indoors or when they go out in the rain uh, of the December rainy season, they're very heavily covered up. A lot of people have gone back to masking in the colder weather just to keep the cold and flu season down. So it makes things pretty easy for you to move around in unseen. So on this particular night, you're waking up in your new haven. Hmm. As I believe, Marcus has moved his haven out of the longshoreman's office. Yeah, it's uh, no longer the proper space. It's also an enormous target. So given that most of the people, most of the kindred anyway, that were pertinent to San Francisco's political structure as far as the Camarilla goes, they would know to look for Marcus there. Uh, And so it's important in his new role to move into a place that's a little bit more defensible, but also to separate himself from any potential violence on the people that he cares about because he is in proximity, because they're in proximity to him. We've already seen issues there with Greg and Marie in our last season. So Marcus has moved into a new haven. Uh, Katerina's not there this evening. She's got other business to attend to. Um, but why don't you give me a rouse check? Start sure. things off properly. Mm, that is a six. All right. Barely skating by there. One of these days, Marcus is going to fail catastrophically at a rouse oh, check, and oh, I will yeah. enjoy it very, very much. So what is Marcus wanting to attend to this evening? He's got a very busy schedule being the figurehead, so to speak, of this uh, new independent station. Although perhaps you're not calling yourself Baron, as many in the Anarch movement do. You know that others, uh, particularly Mariam and uh, Fuzzy, and the other groups have been referring to you as Baron Voss, and that seems to have picked up steam among the independents in your in your domain. So it's it's a very busy nightlife for you. Yeah, I I think his approach over the past month or so has probably been one of careful and targeted moves. I think after the events of the blood moon and, and after the proclamations, I think he very much went to ground with the idea that all of the support he'd secured, he needed to push into place at certain areas. And so over the past month or so, we probably would have seen 
the number of Gangro and Bruja, especially on that that fisherman's wharf to the the port of San Francisco side, really blossom. And so that is in part to protect his space, but also to make good on the agreement with those clans. Uh, so that is part of it. And I think he's probably been focused too a little bit on making sure that that separation between kindred and kind in his life is a little bit more evident, not to anybody else, but evident to himself, right? He perhaps is a little mistaken uh, in, in the previous months that he could ride the edge of being that leader within the union and yet still exist in a place where he was a member of a coterie and, you know, a member of Clan Bruja and, and, and the Camarilla and whatnot. And so separating himself out and putting him in his own haven where it's set apart from his business life, I guess he is hoping that things will go a little bit better. But that said, someone has to take Marie's position. And someone has to pick up that mantle, uh, however difficult it might be for them. Right. And for the last couple of weeks, you've had a new office manager. Uh, her name is Gloria. And she used to be the executive assistant for a very high profile uh, tech CEO. She lost her job, as you know, in 2020 during a Black Lives Matter protest when she got arrested for protesting. The union actually uh, banded together, as you do. And the the board fought, got her job back, got her a nice settlement, and she immediately quit her job and went to work for the labor union. So she's been working for almost two years with the Labor Council of San Francisco. You know she's effective, you know she's smart, and you know she can run a tight ship. So you requested, if she was willing, that uh, she come in and take over for a bit, see how things go. She's been working in your office, managing things for a couple weeks. Greg hasn't touched caffeine that entire time, which was a big surprise to everyone, including him. But so far, she seems to be doing an admirable job handling things in your absence. Yeah, I probably would be a, a first stop on a, on a solo night for Marcus. He's probably going by the office, uh, given the fact that he'll get there and still have a little bit of the working day left that he could probably get into it, uh, details with, uh, with Gloria. He'd probably want to see uh, how things are going and uh, ask if there are any needs that she has. So you make your way over to the union office. It's not that far as distance goes. The docks isn't a huge, huge area compared to the rest of San Francisco. And Gloria's still at her desk. There's a couple other workers here. Polly's here. You see Greg packing up in the back. He looks very neat, very well put together. His hair's combed. There's no coffee cups whatsoever on his desk. And he just sort of nods and waves at you. He, he's still a little tired and, and a little uncomfortable after what he went through. You did have Rom meddle with his memories a bit but the trauma itself is still going to be there for a little while. But he just sort of waves at you and heads off for the night. And Gloria stands up when you enter. She hasn't quite broken that habit from her years working as an executive assistant for a CEO, but mm -hmm. she does say, hi, Marcus, instead of Mr. Boss. So that's something. That She's a tall, well-built black woman with a massive afro. Uh, she dresses kind of almost 70s with these bright prints and long bell-bottom jeans uh, but she looks very well put together in this place she looks like she owns the office yeah yeah I, I would expect nothing less uh, I would expect nothing less there for her to own this space that's the sort of person she is she's uh, a lot more upfront than Marie was. He, not that Marie wasn't effective, obviously, but Gloria is going to do business a little bit differently. So, yeah, I'll uh, I'll nod to her and say good evening and ask her what uh, what are the action items of the day. Not too much. She sits down, passes you a few folders, and we've 
taken up collections for Marie's mother, as we decided we were going to do as an office. We should be able to keep her in retirement fairly well for a bit. She sent you a thank you card, by the way, for being a good boss to Marie. I don't know if you want to see that, but that's here. And she pulls it out of a desk, slides it over to you. Uh, We do have a couple ongoing cases right now. We have here San Francisco v. Allen. And she hands you that particular file. Nothing you really need to worry about here, but... uh, Fraud cases are always a bit of an issue with our whistleblower trying to break the laws, you know, labor unions trying to take away his job for being a whistleblower. Can't do that. Right. But, you know, they're always going to try. The fraud, I open the folder, kind of just read a couple of lines out of it. What's the, um, what's the gist of if, what, mm-hmm. what is being done? So a tax accountant for a high-profile firm of lawyers was embezzling funds from clients. And one of the younger workers on the case, this this lawyer firm handled a bunch of warehouses and things for other companies, and one of the younger workers found some of the trash and realized what was going on. So he's not a high-profile worker or anything, he just stumbled across the trash, worked out, someone was stealing money, and he blew the whistle. And so the company, instead of going after the the accountant who is currently being sued, is trying to fire the whistleblower for costing them a lot of money. Even though he should be protected under whistleblower status in the state of California, they're trying to get around it. So the union is is stepping in to get them to drop the case so that he can testify in San Francisco v. Allen. I definitely take some um, notes down just in, in a, um, a form of shorthand as far as the the uh, the lawyers that work in that firm. Having having dealt with lawyers uh, the, the past few months, I'd like to figure out what leverage points there are, if any. So you skim through this list. You don't recognize most of the names other than maybe seeing one or two of them on billboards. But one of them does stand out to you. And this one is Jerry Waterton. And this particular guy is, well, a bit of an ass. He likes taking on cases that people say are unwinnable when it comes to the side of people on the wealthier end of things. So he won't be taking on unwinnable cases for dock workers or the impoverished or anything he will try to prove that you can get away with just about anything if you're wealthy enough right so he thinks apparently that he can get around the whistleblower protection in this case Hmm. interesting he went to school with r4 if that tells you anything yeah i know it sounds like uh, a very similar mentality but uh it's okay we'll disabuse him of that notion All right. Uh, And then the other case that's here. So the other case, it looks like we're going to be getting a settlement out of court. Uh, Our lawyers are talking to theirs. They approached us and she slides you this other folder. And this one is the uh, police brutality case. Our lawyers advise that if we go to court uh, with this, it's going to be drawn out. It's going to be long. And with the immigration status of some of our clients in that particular warehouse in question, it's better to settle and get them their money and allow them to keep working than to actually take it to court. She looks very pissed off when she says this, but you know what police unions are like and you know what it's, you know what it's like here. I'm not sure we can win this if we take it to court. We should, but it's the cops. The problem with the police union is that the police only protect themselves. They protect themselves and nobody else. And I fucking hate it. But if we accept the settlement, and she points out the relevant numbers, then that entire group is going to get a decent amount of money. It'll They have to pay back the unemployment from the last few months. Uh, the, the police union will, and they will also 
uh, give us this settlement, she points out another number, which should protect our clients from hopefully having to deal with the government in unemployment, SNAP benefits, or anything else like that for, for a little while. And they get to keep their jobs, which shouldn't even be in question. But this is the country we live in. Okay. Unlike Marie, Gloria does not hesitate to speak her mind. So here's what I want you to do, Gloria, uh, in regards to this case here specifically. Okay. Um, I want a list of the officers involved. And I'd like us to begin tracking histories. I doubt this is the only police case we're going to get in the next five years. And I'm very much interested in long-term building something we could bring to the authorities against, we'll just say, recidivism in police officers for brutality. I think that's it's a, something the union could track, fight, and win. And if the past few years have been really any uh, example, these officers involved will have more problems. Well, the reason we got the settlement in the first place, she passes you another document from the folder, is these two, and there's Officer Christensen uh, and Officer Bale, both of them white men in their 40s. These two, we found out from the law firm's private investigator, the the lawyers we have on site. Mm. Uh, They've had issues in the past. This one, and she points at Christensen, He sprayed tear gas on a pregnant woman at a protest last year, and she lost the baby. We found that out, and we also found out that they never did anything about it. So we might have uh, hinted that there might be some more issues related to that if they didn't settle up. So we know there's that at least, but I'll get you the the rest of, of the info that I can get from the PI. Okay, stay on top of it then. You got it. How the staff treated you? She smiles. I mean, it takes a while to really settle into the rhythm of things, especially when uh, you have someone coming in after such a tragedy. And she just kind of tilts her head slightly over. There's a plaque on the wall. Someone put up with a picture of Marie and people have left a few notes and flowers, kind of like they do on gates at people's homes. But... We're working together pretty well. They seem fairly energized. There's a lot going on and everyone seems pretty focused. I think they just appreciate having direction, if I'm being completely honest. Sure. I think that um, Marie was well organized and she was pretty effective. But beyond that, she was one of us. And her death is a tragedy. So there's always going to be a little bit to get over in that regard. Um there are likely me- multiple members of staff that, that are not over it. It's not been very long. So, And she was a fighter. She was someone who was very passionate about what she did. Um, but it's in those memories that we're going to keep fighting. Collated her notes on the project she was working on so we can keep pressing forward with those. She shows you a folder with Marie's notes on the fair housing project that she had started just before she died. And uh, I think you, either you or someone else left a note asking if she'd left any particular belongings that she was attached to. Right. And she pushes over a a box. I found this in her locker, finally got into it. I feel kind of weird going through someone's personal things. But you find there's a watch that Marie used to wear fairly frequently. It's old. It's probably, it looks to you, older than you probably an heirloom. She never took it with her out of the office, but she kept it in her locker, presumably to prevent people from stealing it uh, if she got mugged. And there's a few other things, family pictures, uh, a small stuffed lion, a few letters and postcards from people around the world. Should I reassign her locker or leave it for a while? I don't know what the protocol is in these kinds of situations. No, if, the, if that's all there is in the locker, then I'll take the items and then you can reassign it. Okay. If nothing else, uh, if no one else is comfortable with it, the staff can leave it empty. That's fine with me. You got it. 
Um, you have a visitor upstairs, by the way. Upstairs? Yes. She said something about, well, this is where I always met him. He's reading off notes. So if he shows up, tell him I'm here. Odd. Years ago, I did a lot of late night work here. And so I I had a space upstairs because it was just easier than driving back to my apartment. You understand? She nods. They told me uh, you and uh, the guy before you and a few others were very dedicated to the work like that. So, I mean, my previous boss down at the Labor Council also had an office upstairs for late night work. Yeah, I mean, um, it's also a place that we would go after a rally or a strike, sit down, strategize, have a few drinks, that sort of thing. Can't be in the office all the time. No, no, you can't. I'll go check it out. All right. I appreciate the time. You got it, Marcus. She goes back to work. I think in my head, well, I'm going to have to figure out some future for her because if I don't, then Jean will, and that would be dangerous. Just a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I'll uh, head upstairs and uh, look at the the empty outer office area, which used to have a bunch of furniture in it that is now gone. Are they in that space or are they in where I had my bedroom? Uh, upstairs in the open space, seated, sitting against the wall, just like sort of leaning back, hands behind her head, casual pose. You see a tall, blonde woman. She's got long blonde hair pulled back in a ponytail. She's wearing tight jeans, a leather biker jacket. She's got some scars across her neck and the lower part of her face. Uh, and she's holding a motorcycle helmet under one arm. And she looks at you and she says you get new digs without telling me Marcus and this you know is one Jane Doe who is a Zmitzi contact of yours who has been out of town for a couple years but occasionally pops up usually just when you don't want her around (laughs) she has a knack for that this is the second Zmitzi I've attracted funny how that works did I get new digs uh, yes, I did. Sort of out of a requirement. Yeah, I heard from Frank. There's been some uh, upheavals going around. Listen, I'm not here for too long. Just, uh, one, I heard you might be needing some medical assistance down here at some point. So if you're needing that, give me a call. But also I've got three young women of uncertain legal status from Texas if you know what I mean I mean sure where did they come where where did you find them Hmm. did you pick them up in Texas I picked them up in Texas and by legal status I mean I had to give them some help they're undocumented workers and I gave them the help that only I can give you know, Jane it tends to go into places to give reproductive care and abortions in undetectable ways, usually, with her flesh crafting skills. And Certainly. then she tends to clean up the mess afterwards. They can't go back, not with the head hunting rules going on in that crazy ass place. Call us monsters. But wondering if you know any of the places in your little. Is it barony down here that you can give them some work because they can't go home? If you're going to ask for a favor, Jane, maybe try not to smirk so much when you say the word barony. Especially when it was when it was bought and paid for with blood. I only smirk at that, Marcus, because I haven't heard you calling it that and I haven't heard anything official. It's just word on the street. You can never trust Frank when he calls anything anything, so... Don't know exactly what to call it, but that's the word I got. But yes, you're right. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened in San Francisco while I was gone. All I know is it's a mess. Yeah, well, I can give you the quick rundown. If you want. Mm, Quick version. Sure. Quick version is this. The Sabat 
created an infectious bloodborne virus. They injected it into the kind around here that like to play around with heroin and other sorts of drugs. And then once it was in the blood supply, it got into vampires, infected them, and killed them over a period of four to five nights. It was a Sabat pack that was aimed in effect at the Kindred of San Francisco, but whose leader um, I had encountered during the war here. Motherfuckers. <sighs> yeah, I don't get down with the religious zealots. It doesn't matter what side of the fence it's on. As far as the girls go, I have spots they could go to. If it has to be San Francisco specific. It doesn't. They just need to disappear somewhere they can get work and California's good for healthcare. Agreed. Let me make a call. I have um, friends across the bay who might be able to assist. If nothing else, um, I know a bunch of badass um, bikers who can probably take them in temporarily. And they won't have to worry about any sort of uh, continuing entanglements as far as sexuality go anyway. She snickers. Fuzzy? Mm-hmm. Mm. We made a deal. Hmm. That would explain why I saw them all laughing it up down in the Castro. Okay, yeah. things are starting to fit together now. Yeah, I uh, I worked a verbal agreement with some of the country gang on the Bruja. Okay. Well, I'm not on anybody's side, as you know. But fuck the cam. <laughs> fuck the sabat. So, I'm just in town at the moment with these kids. I don't know what else to call them. Fucking Texas. And need to get them safe and then I'm going back because I have some... She kind of rubs her hands and smirks a little bit in those cold eyes. Got some cleanup to do. But uh, I've, I've heard you're going to have a, a clinic of some kind. You're going to need it down here. If you need yeah. my particular skills in exchange for this uh, favor you're doing me here, let me know. I'm already hearing people having trouble getting pills and other things just because pharmacists are starting to get worried about repercussions, even in California, which is fucked up. So, if you need my help. Certainly, I'll take it. The plan was to start up a clinic, a free clinic hmm. of sorts, uh, down in the, uh, <laughs> the, the barony. I sort of spread my hands out. Whatever you want to call it. So that way she we could asks. deal with a bunch of these issues, whether it be kindred or kind, the it doesn't matter what side of that life on life fence you're on, it seems like the powers of be are desperate to fucking squeeze. So while the Prince Regent decides which one of my family members she's gonna go after next, we need to ensure that the kindred who do walk these spaces can do so carefully and that the people who are here can get a hold of services because we're all one big happy family. <laughs> family. Right. She just sort of shakes her head. Well, on the kindred side of things, are you aware of my other service? This one costs. I'm not. Go ahead. Some of us get embraced before we physically match who we are. I can fix that. Wouldn't do it for free. I've done it a few times. There's a couple people in San Francisco who owe me favors now as a result. I don't care if it's Cam or not. It's important. But if any of the Anarchs, is that the right word for you? Okay. I suppose. If any of your Anarchs are in need of such a thing, give me a ring. Sure. I'll be happy to do it at a cost. But no one can know. What do you mean no one can know? That I'm here. Okay. Except Frank. <laughs> You'd have a hard time not uh, tipping off Frank's radar. It's pretty good. Yeah, we're friends. It'll be fine. I'm going to be hanging out in the Castro for a bit with him. He seems to have made it his uh, territory. You don't want to mess with 
Zmitsi territory. Good luck, Billy. I'm, I'm fairly familiar with the rules, having uh, dealt with Frank over the years. That said, I think it's great what you're doing. The offer, anyway, is super helpful, especially to those of us who have a real hard time um, dealing with the bodies that we are embraced into. That's the main reason I'm in town. I brought the kids with me because mm-hmm. I was on my way, but I've got someone who needs help. So all I'll say is this. Uh, I'm happy to point people your way mm-hmm. should they require it. I'm happy to have you work in the domain uh, provided you do so carefully. But the one stipulation I'll put on it is that you don't operate on any cam in my territory unless they renounce. Fuck no. You think I'd br- I'd bring a cam into your territory to do my work and then just let them walk out? I think that you care more about making sure that people are put where they need to be put as they see it rather than what tag they wear on the back of their jacket. Mm-hmm. But I also know not to get involved in a scuffle between cam and anarch. Had enough of that in my existence. Yeah, Anarch is really a Camarilla word, but... You know how we feel about territory. I do. It's not just Frank. This is your territory. I am your guest. I will respect it. I appreciate that. I'm certain that we'll come to an agreement should we need to. Just don't expect me to refuse services to someone just because they're Cam. I'll go off your land if I have to. But I don't pick and choose. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect you to refuse services. I think, I think you might find that maybe we have more opportunity for you here than you might think. I know you got to go back to Texas and do whatever you've got to do, but I got word of a case recently of a police officer involved in a brutality situation. Not that most aren't. Um, we're going to end up settling that case, it looks like. But it looks like one of these fuckers evidently maced a pregnant woman. She lost the baby. And I kind of think that it might be nice to drop by that officer's place and at some point remind them that they don't get to treat women like cattle. Do some removals? I'd say, uh, I'd say if it's necessary, it's necessary. Mm. Oh, it's always necessary, Marcus. And she, you get, she gets this kind of look of glee nice. in her eyes, as opposed to the seriousness when she's talking about other things. This this is the fun part. I'll make sure that you have their address. It's just uh, it's important that we settle first, and then All we right. can drop by. Brad's getting a little hungry again. <laughs> you know, Brad is the uh, Ventru former cop that she flesh crafted into her motorcycle. Yeah, we have a venture problem here in this town, too. Shocking, right? Really? I yeah. never would have guessed. With Billy the Hammer. A- a- Esme's out, obviously. At at Billy's doing. No idea where Esme is now. And that's okay, because quite frankly, we didn't really see eye to eye on a few things. Uh, that said, he's now Prince Regent. <laughs> That motherfucker? Mm. Hmm. He's trying to hold that Wait. side of the uh, fence together with, uh, mm-hmm. I assume, the loyalty of Clan Toreador and uh, Clan Tremere and probably at least a passing interest of the Malkavians, the, those of whom are loyal to the Camarilla. Mm. Uh, the, uh, the Nosferatu had been mostly chased out by uh, Esme or, or others. Now that could have been because of what was going on with the the dirty blood. I could see that. Um, but Clans Bruhan Gangrel are mostly mine mm. as far as loyalty goes. And I picked up some other friends while I was over there too. Diversified my um, friend circle so to speak. Mm. Yeah, Frank tells me you got a Hakata. Have fun with those creeps. Which is rich coming from a Zimitsi. Let's be real. You know, the the one I have interacted with on a regular basis has been 
at least willing to work with us. Well, I'm not going to question your unlife choices, Marcus. But, uh, I'm going to be heading out to Mississippi tomorrow night. She flips through a small calendar she pulls out of her pocket. Got a situation to take care of. Ari, some bathroom bills. So, I'm going to go clean that up. And then I'll need a place to lie low for a little bit. If you don't mind. No. And I can help you with your cop problem. Sure. I think the first step would be to get the clinic set up and and going. Um, I've got... uh, I have somebody already that I'm going to put on it. And then someone in a supervisory role. But I think Mm -hmm. for certain services, I'd much rather have an experienced hand, or hands for that matter, working that portion of it. Well, when I do some modifications this time after I get back, I can give you four. She smiles. As long as the curtain stays up, I'm sure they won't mind. Well, I can tell you some parents in small town Mississippi, I'm not saying where, are going to be very surprised in a couple days when they wake up and find their trans kids are, well, trans. So it's going to be great. Going to make some people disappear into other things. And then I'll come back and lay low, give you some help out, and uh, maybe Frank and I can do something about your ventry problem. It is a problem. It is, it's not a problem that's not fixable. It's fixable long term, but uh, it's a problem because what they are interested in is complete and utter domination, much like the rest of their clan. And the people of San Francisco and the kindred of San Francisco have already shown them that they're not going to take it lying down. I'm sure Brad won't be too happy, but he doesn't get a say anymore. So, we'll work something out. Sorry to drop in on you uninvited. Just don't have much time before I need to go. He didn't break any rules. It's not the official home anymore, so... That's why I'm up here. So, not going to break in next time. Just, she passes you a slip of paper with a number on it. This is my current burner. It'll be in use for the next five days. Sounds good. I'll send you a text when I'm on my way back. You just tell me where to go, and then that phone will be gone. So. Perfect. (sighs) All right. Frank and I are going to go have a drink, and then I'm off to Mississippi. So. Good luck with your venture in the meantime. And uh, here's the... She passes you another piece of paper. Here's the motel where the girls are staying. You don't have to interact with them personally. Just have someone help them set up. Certainly. So, all right. She puts her motorcycle helmet back on. You swear you see the reflections of eyes glinting out of it in various places. Catch you later. I take a look at the paper after she takes off and then... Uh... Yeah, it's a, it's a small motel in the lower end of town, so they're not going to stand out too much, but it's a decent place with decent security, so they should be safe there. But it's it's definitely not within your territory. Yeah, that's dangerous then. Okay, I head back downstairs. Jane has disappeared out the door. That's okay. Gloria just kind of raises an eyebrow. That's eh, an old friend from work. Mm. All right. Gloria, um, I have a question for you. Who do we know at San Francisco Power and Water? Power and Water... She turns to her computer and opens up a couple folders. Okay, let's see. We've got uh, Roberta Jimenez. Mm -hmm. She should be... All right. Uh, She's actually the secretary, but her brother works at the docks. So there's a connection there. Uh, And what levels at the company do you want... Roberta's the secretary. We've got boots on the ground, so to speak. She prints off a list. I need a, um, I need a union foreman and, uh, maybe somebody who works a crew for power and water. That's, uh, pretty important. The union foreman's list is here. She hands you a list of 
five names because there's five different union crews over there doing okay. various various tasks. And if you want your crew chiefs, that'll be goes to another folder. Okay, we've got six of those. Anyone in particular? Do we have anybody here who we know by resume has worked uh, in commercial fire? Faith Wicks, yeah. Okay. I want you to set up a meeting. Okay. I have a request from them. I have a request for them that I need them to fill. It's um, it's a special request. Okay. Uh, I'll see when they can meet. And then I turn around. Just normal business for her. So mm-hmm. she makes a note and gets on the phone. I walk out with the box of Marie's stuff. So you walk out into the chilly December night. It is raining now. You tend to get the most rain uh, in San Francisco in December and January. And tonight's just one of those nights where it's decided to give you that kind of half rain, half drizzle mm. that nobody really likes. Not super pleasant, but what you going to do? I am going to move on to the next thing, as it were. Mm-hmm. So I sort of get in the car and start scrolling through my head uh, a little bit about what is next to do. And I'm going to go down to Pier 12. So I will be going down to Pier 15. And uh, I will be looking at some open office space they have for the clinic that I'd like to bring there. Okay, so you're going down to Pier 15, mm-hmm. which is down by the Northern water f- Waterfront. This particular pier is not as busy as it used to be. A lot of the offices closed down during the pandemic and didn't reopen. So mm-hmm. it's a pretty good spot for you to scout out your, your office space. There are several buildings, but taking a, a look, you're thinking you're going to want to go further down the pier because 15 is right across from the consulate of Switzerland. (laughs) So you don't want to have to deal with all the security and everything that normally goes in and out of a consulate. So you're probably going to want to go further down the pier rather than closer to shore. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that tracks. Uh, So then I'll probably move into the high 20s. There's Mm -hmm. a... um, Pier 27 is a cruise terminal, so we wouldn't want to be anywhere near there, per se. Yeah. Uh, But we could look at... uh, There is some office space here that's at Pier 29. Okay. Just beyond that, there's even a roll-up door, which could be useful. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And so I will definitely look into Pier 29. Also, too, uh, not, not far from some of the other thoroughfares. There's a lot of good... There's a, there's a fair amount of uh, good traffic patterns here. so, And it also puts us within spitting distance of Pioneer Park, which the uh, country gangle have been using. So we have allies fairly close. Yes, and you also have some rather large parking garages in the area, which make it easy for people to get in and out. And mm-hmm. also easy hunting grounds for those who prefer some light stalking. I mean... I enjoy stalking as much as anyone. Indeed you do, as we have seen. All right, so you head down to Pier 29. There's plenty of office space down in that in that area. You're mm-hmm. specifically looking for something probably ground floor, so it's accessible. Yeah, ground floor, accessible. And then also I want to make sure that, uh, and it looks like I should be able to do this. I want to make sure that it does not have a... <laughs> A eastern facing window like set. Now, western facing is, of course, going to happen, and that's fine. But uh, eastern facing would not be uh, would not be very helpful at all. Correct. The the pier is right. Pier twenty nine is rife with all that. Right. So you you definitely have your options here. There's one building that looks like it's had a for rent sign in it for probably about a year. Mm-hmm. Rent has been fairly astronomical in San Francisco for quite a long time. And with the pandemic and everything, it's hard for people to afford to put their shops into 
any area of San Francisco if they're not already well established. So this particular building's one story looks like it used to have an arcade on one side and some maybe a, a department store of some kind and some clothing stores on the other side. So it's got plenty of, of rooms to move around in if you were to rent the entire building. Uh, we'll look at doing that. That seems like a, a good set place for it's not too far from where I call home. It's also sort of helpful for a future move. So mm -hmm. we'll say uh, Pier 29 will be the clinic. Okay. And it'll be easy to get in contact with whoever's renting it, this estate company that rents out these buildings, so that won't be too difficult, just, you know, during normal working hours. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's totally usable. I think what I'd probably like to do, too, if we can, is see about renting that portion of it and then what the what else they possibly control within the building. So we'll 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 uh, talk to talk to them at length, perhaps about the size, because obviously the clinic is one thing, but having additional space because space is finite uh, could be helpful. The big thing that I want to do with the clinic is I want to make sure that the clinic also has space to hold a temporary amount of blood. Uh, so the clinic will be a spot where we not only offer free services, we not only offer medical practices for, for both kindred and then, of course, kind. But also it is going to be a waypoint amongst my domain about where we will store blood. And the th one of the things that will make it easy there is just on the other side of you over by Pier 27 is you have a cruise terminal. Right. So you have cruise ships going in and out plenty of uninfected visitors that you could obtain donations from certainly as, as you choose so you definitely have in this area it's a good place to set up because you have access to people you know you can get clean blood from and it'll be mm -hmm. easy to transport because your clinic will be right there so who, whoever you have doing that it'll make it really easy for them well uh, she doesn't know it yet but she will and that will be part of Katerina's job. Uh, so while Vince will eventually work in the clinic and hopefully rebuild whatever portion of his soul may be left, uh, if that's possible, uh, the idea with Katerina sort of getting out of the baking life is um, hopefully she won't be getting out of the farming life uh, because that is something that we need her to do so that way people who live amongst the domain don't have to seek out uh, as many feeding spots and so they're not lured into Camarilla territory because they have more feeding ground it's a, it's a way we're hoping to mitigate the need for them to go elsewhere and this is definitely a, a pretty good location for you to set all of that up and then the only other thing I need to do that is prescient pertinent I need to speak with the gang real primogen. I'll have to make like three phone calls, right? So um, okay. I, need to, I need to talk with, with them. And then I need to talk with uh, Fuzzy, obviously, about the, the girls. And then I need to talk with Jean to help wrangle all this. So are you calling Mariam? Yeah, I'm going to call Mariam first because uh, it's important for a mm -hmm. couple reasons. Okay. So are you staying down by Pier 29? Are you? Yeah. There's, I don't need to cross to Oakland unless unless I think that Mariam would rather have a face-to-face -face chat. If I get that read on her, I mean, she's a country gang girl, so she might be a little opposed to the phone, actually. Yeah, I'll, I'll drive mm -hmm. over there. I know, I know uh -huh. where she's at. All right. So you let Mariam know you'd like to meet, and she texts you back saying that she's got a little bit of free time uh, and then she she's gotten into kind of a bit of a slightly not quite jokey mood with you ever since the the, the finale like the big showdown uh, in Elysium where you announced your plans but she, she's gotten a little more relaxed 
with mm-hmm. you since you're not Cam anymore. And so she sends you directions and, and says, uh, see you soon, Baron. And there's a little smile face and then your phone turns off. Very strange. Yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll go meet her wherever um, in particular she wants to meet. So this time she doesn't have you go to the same kind of neutral spot that she had you visit when you set up your original meeting with her and the gangrel. Mm-hmm. This time she meets you in a park. She's sitting on a bench under a tree. Sunset in the Bay Area in December is about 5 p.m. So it's only about 6, 6.30. But there's that drizzle. And there's not a whole lot of people out. But Mariam is sitting on this bench with the tree providing some protection from the rain. And there's a few pigeons sitting on the bench next to her. Hmm. More pigeons. I'll walk up. Marcus. Hi. Pleasure to see you. It's been a few weeks. Busy weeks. Mm. Yes, uh, all of my friends over in your territory are quite enjoying the new setup, so I hear. Yeah, that's uh, been made. I've been made to understand that it, uh, most are enjoying the liberties of finally being able to walk in San Francisco without looking over their shoulder constantly. Yes, well, the ones who went went with you are the ones who were forced out of San Francisco originally to begin with, and they're quite happy to be home. I was, uh, I was hoping. I sit down on the on the bench. I, I was hoping that you would um, be willing to speak with them um, and perhaps remind them of that part of the agreement. I've been made to understand that. Uh, the new Prince Regent is looking to solidify some things on the Camarilla side. And in doing so, he will likely be formulating a way to reach back out and reclaim portions of San Francisco. Oh, he can try. And he will. Hmm. Yes, well, you know how we are with territory? Yeah. Yeah. I happen to. She smiles a toothy smile. Uh, now you've got his meats over there, I hear. Just passing through for the moment. Hmm. Well, between between him and us, Billy is going to have quite a fight of it. Yeah, I'm sure that the Prince Regent was a little uh, upset that they didn't get their hand-picked prince to place. Mm. Seemed they... Had a problem. One of my little friends, and she pats one of the pigeons on the head, saw the whole thing. Hysterically funny. Good. Uh, Also, uh, you has disappeared. So the only gangrel presence on the cam side of things is Victoria Llewellyn and the couple other gangrel who stayed with the cam anyway because they just wanted to be nice, wealthy, happy vampires in their happy little offices. Sounds like green. Oh, speaking of, she tosses you a bag. It's a small, like, bag you'd put dice in. A little velvet yeah. bag. If you look inside, it's full of shark teeth. Shark's teeth? My, my. He won't be a problem anymore. Thought you might like a souvenir. Or maybe your friend who got half eaten might speaking of that I have a little project that might involve that little birdie and perhaps some of your kin oh I'm going to be working with Rom on a project something that can give us a a method of communication that is off kindred, kindred and kind radar really yeah. And in an ideal setting, we might be able to supplement the strength of the network based on birds. She starts laughing, and one of the pigeons just sort of nuzzles up against her arm. 
Sounds like that human conspiracy theory where all the birds are watching you and therefore they're not real. They're just CIA cameras or some sort of bullshit. Mm, well, moreover, birds can carry a lot of things, even if they're small. Mm. And they could plant things in places that other people couldn't get to. That's the great thing about animals is they can go places that people can't. Oh, yes. We are aware. I'm certain you are. And so it might be beneficial to both San Francisco and Oakland if there was a a network, one that was, yes, technological, but perhaps one that fluctuated as necessary. Sort of, um, well, sort of like playing an old game of telephone, but one that allowed access to things like the internet and... Data. Hmm. Interesting. You might want to have a chat with some of the city lot. We tend to not care quite so much in the country gangrel about technology and the internet. But our city siblings, same bloodline, they just prefer living she gestures dismissively off towards the city in the urban jungle. So they're more likely to have the skills you need. But mm. I'm suppose, I suppose we can also help put things in place if you just show us what to do. I was actually looking more for specifics. Uh, a specific building. Oh, were you now? Well, certainly. The, the nice part about birds is that they can exist at all hours of the day. And I'm certain that they keep watch over all sorts of locations for you. You'd be, you wouldn't have, have stuck around this long if you weren't constantly keeping watch. And so I'd like to impress upon you the beneficial nature of keeping an eye on a very specific, very tall building here in the city. One that's known for crypto mining. If there were pigeons there, perhaps nesting, that could speak to the internal movements, look through windows, that sort of thing. Hmm. And what makes you think there's not a few of them there already? She pets her pigeon (laughs) on the head. I have no doubt there's a possibility of them already being there. So it's that much easier of an ask. I guess... Knowing what your enemy is going to do before they do it is beneficial. And in this case, while the dust may have settled on Elysium and the Blood Moon, the war with the Ventru, specifically the Prince Regent, is only starting. He's already... I sort of pause and look at the rain for a second. He's already taken out some of my human family. He burned one to death in front of me. Her eyes narrow into slits... And so, while I realize the Gangrel bloodline and its clan of old has many differences with Bruja, uh, we treat family very similarly. And so, while I have not personally retaliated against the prince yet, it is not to me to say that I will not. It is all about timing and getting my enemy exactly where I need them to. I see. You know... One of the very few things that most of us have always held as our own little tenant, even if unspoken, is the human family is off limits. Usually, when we retaliate against each other, we target each other or the other kindred around. We don't go for the mortals. It's not... I suppose William would say sporting. Tend to agree. And it's not the first, and it certainly won't be the last. But the difference between William and I is that this is my city. I am San Francisco. He is from England. Or wherever the fuck. And so I think the city cares more, in some way, about 
a son of San Francisco, so to speak. This is my home, too. My family has been here for three generations. At least three generations before me. Now it's probably seven or eight. We've been here a while. Oakland spreading out. Do you know my grandfather was the first imam in this part of the bay? I was not aware. This is home for me. And for many of us. Gangrel often stay where they came from. I don't know if you know that. Stay in the same general area. We are attached to place. So I think I can speak for most of the clan when I say that this is ours. Marcus. And perhaps the hammer will learn that to his regret. One would hope. One would hope. Very well. I, um, I won't take up any more of your time. But I will say that my newest visitor has some very special talents. A friend of mine has paid me a visit. She's, she's very similar to my friend who's taken up residence in Castro, except that she has an exceptional talent. Working with kindred and their bodies and shaping them into the people they were meant to be. And so, because she offered it, I would offer it to you or any of your country gangle. Should any of them choose her services, they are available. They are not free, of course, but if they are, they have any wish to change who they are biologically, to better fit who they are, she is available. She thinks for a minute, she looks serious not got that kind of half smile that she's had for most of this conversation my child may perhaps seek such a service if they do contact me and I will put the two of them in the same room if necessary I have uh, another matter as well that she has brought me unfortunately uh, one I will I will deal with with uh, our Bruja friends. And what do you expect in return for this introduction? I look a little quizzical. I have already asked. Nothing you wish to add on to the arrangement? No, that's the old way of doing things. The new way of doing things is a little different. She looks like she doesn't quite believe you, but she doesn't push any further... But she does stand up to signal that the conversation is over. Certainly. I stand up. It is not uh, appropriate to refer to me as Primogen anymore. I've taken Chief. So, keep that in mind, Baron. I will, Chief. (laughs) She chuckles a little bit. And she inclines her head and says, Allah be with you. And with you. We'll be in touch. She walks away into the rain, cloud of pigeons following her. I head back to the car and I call Fuzzy. You call Fuzzy. You hear some very loud music in the background and there's someone else yelling in a very deep voice, take it off! And some cheering. Hey, Marcus. Hey, 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 how you doing? Uh, I got a question. Uh, one minute. It's a bit loud in here. And you hear the sound of moving away and a door opening as the noise in the background gets a little bit quieter. You can still hear the music, club music playing in the background, but it's not so loud that you can't hear Fuzzy anymore. So, uh, listen, I, uh, I have a request to make, a very simple one, but an important one. Yeah, my man, what you got? I've got three mortals, girls. They um they came by way of Texas. They had oh. to they had to leave 
for specific reasons. They're holed up in a motel on uh, the south side of, of the blocks here. And it's secure and all that, but it's not where we need them to be. Mm. I've got an address I want to give you. I need to know if you can go and pick them up and bring them to where I need them to be. Yeah, sure, sure. You got it. Anything for you, Baron. <laughs> Thanks. He chuckles uh, this deep, gruff chuckle. So you'll you'll use the name Jane with them. They know Jane. Oh yeah, Jane. We were drinking with her last night. Okay. She's she's made a request that uh, we help these girls out, and we're going to fulfill it. You got it. Just send it on over. I'll uh, I'll take a couple of the girls. They'll uh, maybe make them feel a bit more comfortable. Probably, probably. Mm-hmm. All right, I'll uh, message you the information. And then uh, you can take it from there. Just let me know when it's all wrapped up. You got it. I hang up the phone. And then I head back to the New Haven. And I text Gene to meet me there. Okay. Uh, So you text Gene. And since you're still coming across the the bridge from Oakland, it won't be a problem for her to be there by the time you arrive. Gene has set up in your domain, in your Mm -hmm. territory. She's gotten her own apartment and the other 11 La Sombra who were in San Francisco have all moved into the territory as well. They don't, they don't feel safe with Billy in charge. So they just all up and decided the moment they heard the prince was gone, that they were just heading into Anarch territory with Jean. So they've got their own little enclave. Mm -hmm. They're all staying in the same apartment building. Uh, but Jean is at your door waiting for you when, when you arrive. It's in black jeans and a leather jacket and a long tunic. Got the blue lipstick and blue eyeliner as usual. Just sort of leaning against the door. I smirk at Jean. You know, you look uh, pretty done up tonight. Well, we might have been about to have a party. Well, listen, I won't keep you very long, but I just have some business items we need to attend to. Yep, of course. She stretches a little bit. Whatever you need, boss. All right. So we're going to be opening a free clinic on the pier here, down on Pier 29. The action item on this for you, the important part is that we're going to be buying not only the single space, but a little bit beyond that. We might be able to pick up some traffic from the cruise ships that come by. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, the clinic is going to be a spot where we offer free services. Uh, we'll have a couple of our kind in there, in and out as necessary. Vince may use it as a front to do some of his work. Yeah, he's, he's going to need a place for uh, some of the still filtering out all of this shit. Yeah, exactly. So it'll act uh, as a front there, and then got it. at night he can do what he needs to do as far as uh, any continued cleansing. We're going to continue to offer that service as best we can. Um, it's also going to give us access to the back end of the pier itself, and that may be a spot where we can have Sebastian stop at some point in the future. She smiles. Oh, he'll love that. He will, but I have a feeling that Sebastian doesn't realize some of the things that I know. Okay. And I feel like at some point he's going to find out that I know them. Well, he does have a way of finding things out. We want to play extra special nice with the Keeper of Elysium for a little while. But at some point, we're going to remind them that They're not completely innocent when it comes to what happened during the blood moon. Her brow furrows slightly as she stops taking notes. I'll let you know when it's important. All right. You don't think he's a danger, do you? I don't. I think there's some facilitation that happened previously that has been quietly swept under the rug by a gallivanting and marauding coterie that took over the city for a few days. Aha. Uh-huh. And so while others may think that 
this fact has been gleaned over, glossed over, as it were. At some point, we're going to remind the Keeper Elysium that he isn't clean yet in our book. You might be the very first person I have ever met to hold something over Sebastian Melnoth. She just kind of has this slight look of awe. Just, I don't mean trading favors. I mean, actually, I've never known anyone to have actual dirt on Sebastian. How did you do that? It's a talent. It's a gift. Hmm. You have many talents. Stick around. You may find a a few more. Prince Velasquez really underused you. (sighs) Prince Velasquez was worried about other things. Hmm. The wrong things, as it turns out. Well, they're not here anymore, right? Nope. They're not. And I am. Secondly... Okay. We need to get a corral on this sort of dovetails into from the conversation about Sebastian. We need to put up our own sort of social blitz, as it were. I think the truth of the matter is, is that the Prince Regent is scrambling. I think he may not want other people to see that he's scrambling, but I know he is. He's had two clans mostly leave his domain. Uh, One half of one clan that's not returned. Uh, He has an unknown number of Nosferatu that no longer exist within the city. And so he essentially has Tremere, Toreador, and Malkavian at best. And while socially the Toreador are going to help him immensely, the Tremere can keep continuing on doing what would Tremere do. Um, The Malkavians are, well, Malkavians. I think he's a lot weaker than he perceives And he's going to want to likely strike out and show his strength. And he will aim it directly at us. I'm already hearing some rumors from my contacts that I've kept over on that side of town. Mm -hmm. Out in the cam portion of things. Half of the Primogen Council's gone. Half the whips are gone. The Malkavians are, well, just all over the place. Mm Mm-hmm. No one can get hold of Sir Roger. At least Billy can't. Sir Roger's mysteriously never there whenever Mm. Billy tries to contact him. That's very strange. Yes, and so with Juanita dead, well, Billy doesn't seem to have a whole lot of a plan, at least not that we can see. And the rest of the city between the... Still crazy deaths that are happening from those who don't get Vince's cure and the fact that there's no real hierarchy at the moment are sort of in the dark and feeling very frustrated other than the Ventru because Ventru you fuck Ventru yeah no I, I figured you might land on that side of the map in, in that regard so that sort of raises an interesting question I have then there are what a dozen or so of your clan here exactly 12 including me 12 loyal members of clan Osama yes oh there's only the 12 of us in town yeah I don't imagine that you any more that came in would willfully serve under a Ventru prince Ventru would never trust us not after we were mostly Sabat at one point Never trusted effector, I think is the saying. I didn't have the opportunity to tangle with a whole lot of Lysambra during the war. Uh, mostly because the Sabat I encountered in your clan were mostly um, power players behind the scenes directing the, well, the foot soldiers. We were always the Lady Macbeths, yes. Yeah. I know that, from what I know anyway of your clan, you lean pretty heavily into institutions. Mm Mm-hmm. And that could be organized religion. That could be any sort of social power structure. And so I have a job for you and your clan. Beyond all of the Seneschal work that you're doing here, helping stitch this thing together, and don't think that that goes unnoticed... We need to get into the social 
institutions of this city, and we need to make them work for us. The unions, by way of my reputation and some of the people that I know will help, but I mean more than that. I mean the people that make San Francisco tick. I see. She starts scratching out some notes in her ever-present notebook. I've got some contacts, and I'll speak to my clans. Well, us. Uh, You know we're all in the same building now. It's very useful. Yes, Telegraph Hill Apartments. I'm fairly well aware. (laughs) She smiles, of course, you know. Just easier. Feels a little bit safer. But, uh, yeah, we'll ha- we can have a meeting, and I know which of my clan have contacts where, and I can start mobilizing them and in- into the net, so to speak. We've got some strings we can pull. Quite a few of them, actually. Hmm. Good. Three of them still have human jobs. So... There's some things we can do there as well. And she snickers. Do you know? We've got a chapter of Daughters of the American Revolution out here. I was not aware. Mm, yes, we do. And uh, do you know who tends to be in that kind of social club, Marcus? Tell me. Very wealthy white women. And they tend to be married to very wealthy white men. And they tend to run a lot of things in town. And, uh, well, let's just say the chapter vice president has no reflection. (laughs) Fantastic. So this, it has an aim. It's power unto itself is useless unless it's used properly. And we're going to use it properly. Yes. And the first aim is going to be We'll just say some redistribution. It's pretty clear to me that Mallet needs resources to fight his war. That's all this is. It's, it's, a, it's a, a war of resources. So whether it be additional ghouls, whether it be additional buildings, whatever it'll be, guns, mortal people that have been dominated to be told to do whatever... I want us to be prepared to turn off those resources, to turn the lights out on them, so to speak. Now, Clan Lasombra being uh, one that is apt at uh, massaging the darkness to do what they want, that is, the way we'll do this is by being in those corners, being in those shadows and seeing they don't expect well, we're very good at shadows in La Sombra. Not quite as good as the Nosferatu, but close enough. William has child there now. Did you know? I wasn't aware. I assumed uh, perhaps in some far off um, parish or abbey. No, here. New ones. I was trying to get some more information on them before I brought it up, but my contacts have... Uh, given me some information in that direction. He sired a married couple. Strange. Yes. Uh, Robin and Jamie, and they have connections to young Vincent. That's unfortunate. Mm Mm-hmm. So, why I wanted to get more information on them, because I don't know what the connection is. I just know that they went to school together. Medical school. Because when I had my contacts do some digging looked into these two found out that they and Vince went to the same school and now both of them are suddenly Ventru neonates and I'm still doing some digging there still trying to figure out obviously he's going to try and use it as some leverage over Vince but I don't know what exactly. I don't know what his plan is. I don't know anything more about these two beyond the fact that they seem to have been sired within the last three weeks. They're brand new. Very new. They've already got that kind of Ventru air, though. But I'm still digging. I'll see what I can get. Uh, I do still have 
a contact in the few Nosferatu who are left who can do some more digging for me. Yeah, my guess is that uh, William will flex his power to get a hold of the Nosferatu as quickly as he can. It's what I would do. There's only a couple of them left. Most of them disappeared as soon as Esme was gone. Esme was the protection, really. And once once Luis was dead, Esme was gone. There weren't that many of them to begin with. There's maybe five left in town. Hmm. I own two of them. Now, now, own. Such a possessive term. They owe me, big time. So they're mm-hmm. not going to go over to Billy. That's what I mean. I know that's still can terminology, owning someone. I'll work on it. But let's just say they both owe me enough that I don't think that they would defect. So there are two who we can count on. I can potentially make overtures to bring them into the territory if that's what you want me to do. Ideally, yes. Um... If nothing else, to show that how much more, how much safer it is. Mm-hmm. You should check with a member of the twelve there. See if they have someone with direct or indirect contacts to the, the commissioners of bays in San Francisco. The commissioners of bays might give us a, a slight edge. I'm sure, one of them has something. Well, it, it has to it has to do more with. Just our ability to get in and influence what happens at the ferry and at the docks. And on a union side, that's a little difficult for me because obviously they're someone that we have had um, strained relationships with in the past. But if there's a way to muscle our way in to more of the peers, I'd like to see what we can do about having some sort of access to Pier 33. It's the one that serves Alcatraz. Right. That would be very useful. It could be exceedingly useful, especially as a um, long-term fallback position if that needs to happen. Well, let's hope that the beckoning gets to him before that happens. Yes, I, I sort of furrow my brow. I I cannot abide this. How the beckoning seems to pick and choose, yeah? And... <laughs> Somehow he can traipse halfway across the world towards us, rather than away. Ventru are strong. They've got very strong wills. For all we know, he's feeling it, but he's somehow able to resist it for now, or... I don't know. I know it's getting stronger from what I hear. I mean, I'm not old enough for it to bother me. I know you're not. But... I'm hearing from some of the others in town. That's where two of the Nosferatu went, you know, when they Mm. left after Esme left. Off to the Middle East? Yep. Not all of them, just two. Mm. But I guess they didn't feel like resisting it anymore once the prince was gone, so they left. Maybe, maybe the Sabbat having been here will have done something? I don't know. I don't know what causes it or or how anyone can resist it but I do know Ventru seem to be the strongest other than Hikata they don't seem to be bothered by it at all <laughs> how lucky for them yes you've still got your Hikata elders around and they're not doing anything but let's hope it gets to him before anything too drastic happens agreed alright and then as for the former members of Esme's coterie the coterie Esme formed is still together you realize that? I know Vincent's here I've seen Katarina upstairs Mm -hmm. I heard something about the Malkavian and getting a yacht (laughs) Rump's going through a pirate phase aren't we all but uh, I haven't seen Alex, but I assumed there was still something since at least three of you are still in this area. Still working hard. Mm. Alex is a special case as well. They have a very particular stance 
we want to accept their neutrality in certain regards. They've agreed in principle to not work against us for certain specific reasons. And I would not doubt if at the end of the night they end up living in the domain as things get continually more difficult for them. Mm. Mostly because they were a part of the coterie that did so much social damage to William. I can't imagine he would let something like that slide. No, he's not one to let declared neutrality get in the way of that sort of thing. Certainly not. I say all that to remind you as Seneschal that they should have freedom of movement within the domain. But we're going to pay very close attention to Vince and to Alex. And that's for two separate reasons. Alex is very much fueled by the information that they gather or that they can gather. That is their role. And and we use that to our advantage. For Vince, he has sustained some damage to himself, one that he is trying to repair. But I also know that William seemed to target him or pick on him or use him in those final nights before we tracked Lamb down and Mm. dealt with him. He had a particular focus on Vince. And so we want to keep eyes on Vince and what he does where he goes. You know the rest of Tremere aren't too keen on him at the moment? Of course. Of course. And for reasonable reasons, obviously. He uh, shouldn't be alive as far as many of them are concerned. Well, the, the whip in particular, I don't know if you know Phoebe Van Ness, but only by name, not by She's reputation. fairly vindictive. She made a few threats. Hmm. And a grandmother, who I've never met, but I know of by reputation, has made it clear that should young Vincent ever end up anywhere in her vicinity, uh, what was it she said, according to Roberta? Ah, uh, yes, um, there won't be a speck of him left to sweep up into a dustpan. Well, that seems strong. But much of what Vince did, he dug himself. And so, as much as I tried to share whatever insights I had with him in some of those early meetings of the Coterie, he just seemed to choose his own path which we all do but the destructive nature the things that he gave into the beast very dangerous there's a reason Esme never gave Karen permission to sire Prince Velasquez was very aware of Karen Stein's tendencies she's had a reputation uh, she had a reputation for spur of the moment making children and then moving mm. on to the next shiny toy. Well, it remains to be seen if Vince can be more than a shiny toy. Not my place to tell you what to do, obviously, but I don't know if you want to have a word with him. I've kept an eye on him ever since he moved in. He. Do you know how he feeds? I'm aware. All right. Just a bit concerned that he might overdo it with sneaking into people's homes at night. Yes. We'll have to figure out a way to sort of look around. I pause for a second. And then, like, I re-rack the information in my brain that she's made me aware of that I was not aware of. Sneaking into people's houses? Well, not always into, but... Climbing up fire escapes, opening windows, and using one of those weird Tremere blood rituals to draw blood out of people while they're sleeping? No, that's not a masquerade violation, is it? I'm less concerned about the violation and more concerned about him getting caught. Much as That's my mentioned. concern, which is why I brought it up to you. I thought it was just a one-night thing, but I've noticed him doing it 
She checks her calendar on six occasions now. It seems to be consistently how he feeds. All right. I'll have to speak with uh, Vince about it. The future nights will bring the five of us back together, I imagine, relatively shortly. As ruling a domain this size is not something one kindred uh, can do easily. It could be done with decades of influence and things paid off. We've, we've moved a lot of stones recently, and so everyone will have to have um, well, some skin in the game, so to speak. Yes, we will. And I haven't forgotten what I promised you. Well, I should hope not. Hmm. It will take more than me. But my family... That's what we refer to ourselves as, since it's just us. Mm. Are aware, and we are going to make sure that you get what you were promised. Good. Esme did a lot of things wrong. I can say that objectively. But they did very, very well in putting you five together. A lot of us, meaning the few of us who were in on what was going on, were very confused as to their logic but I think they knew what they were doing perhaps they saw a future where they weren't here and they needed to ensure that a group could take over or perhaps much like many kindred have happened but our few are so rare to admit they were literally overwhelmed and they didn't know what to do and so they acted out of instinct They were tired, and I say this since they are no longer here. Wish they'd explained to me before they left, taking off in a hurry like that, but, well, they didn't know if they could trust me at the moment, I get it. But I know they were tired when this whole thing started. They've been in charge for a long time, and I don't think they wanted to do it anymore. I realize that there are probably some yet unresolved feelings about them leaving. But just so we're clear, they're not welcome in this domain. I don't think they'll ever be back. And my loyalty to them as a prince ended when they left the domain. When they renounced their princedom. Esme still is some someone... I will not raise a hand against. I consider them a friend. They gave me a home, and they gave me their trust when no one else would. Mm. But I will never act in their interest against you. We have a reputation once we attach our loyalty to a hierarchy. We stick with it. I've given you mine. Just please... If Esme should show their face around here again, please do not ask me to raise a hand against them, because I will not. Oh, no, no, no. That's something I would do personally. Everything that is left with Esme is personal. I can accept that. Well, I will leave you uh, to head back to your party with your family. Uh, Do give them my regards. I shall. And... Perhaps there may come an evening where we could spend time together here and talk about what comes next. Just let me know. Oh, I will. I have no doubt, Marcus. She smiles and puts her notebook away. I see Jean out. This is uh, decent. And then head back upstairs because... With most of my appointments for the immediacy done, there's an awful lot of plotting left to do. And we will leave Marcus to his plotting and see what comes of it next time. Thank you for joining us. I hope you will tune in for the rest of our interludes with this coterie before we get into season two. Thank you and good night. Good night.